Okay, this is Larry Carr, and we will see if everything works the way it's supposed to. This should show up on your screen. Yep. Uh, good. We see it. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, I see it. Um, it was fun, and when I this started quite a few years ago, and I, it was just to be. Larry, you're on mute. Yeah, Larry, I can't hear you. Larry, you're Please. muted. There you go, unmuted. Thank you. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> um, I will very happily start over. Uh, recon, I started looking up the recon name, reconnaissance, back in the beginnings of the times when the Merriam-Webster had gone from paper to computer. And they came up with a very nice definition that fits exactly what we try to do. It's a preliminary survey to gain information. Uh, I worked for the government for 30 years, and so you're going to start with an outline for talk. I got the, that burned into me many, many years ago. Uh, so there'll be a history of recon how things have changed, what we would, the actual stage of, re, of operations are, uh, and then actually talk about what we'll do after an earthquake, some training opportunities, and then questions. But as we commented earlier, if you have questions, let me know. The history of the program really started off with the idea that certs were going to survey their own zone and bring that information to the ARC. Well, that basically would have worked, except there were a lot more zones than there were certs. And as a result, there was a need to do something to cover the various areas that were not being covered. So recon was established to actually explore these areas and report the information into the ARC and they used ham radio because that meant they didn't have to wait to get all the way back to the ark if there was a major emergency of any kind they could quickly tell net control and then the process could be followed to do something about it the los altos hills this was very nice the los altos hills and they're supposed to be an s in there uh town repeater it was dedicated to the actual support of a recon during emergencies. And that's made a very valuable tool for us since we're so spread behind hills here in the Los Altos. I mentioned that as, as we started setting things up in the early days of the CERT program, it, we were told if things fall off the shelf, you're activated, go look at your neighborhood. But it was pointed out by the town management that if you're to be covered under disaster service worker program and the town requires that, that the DSW program requires responders to be activated and assigned a task before they're covered under DSW. So that has become the standard for the process of responders and that didn't hurt him radio operators much because uh, for some background, when I retired from my government job, I volunteered for another government job and I was the chief radio officer for Santa Clara County Office of Emergency Services for about 12 years. And as part of that, I, my job was to coordinate ham radio operations throughout the county. What this really, the county decided, and, made, and now is the town has decided, is that if you're a licensed cert ham radio operator and registered as a DSW, uh, you are recognized as having checked in and assigned and given assignment to the conversation you have with net control on our earthquake net. So you will be directed to an assignment, but the, the real point about this is that you need 
to maintain radio contact with the net control, this goes back to DSW. The first order in DSW is that you must be supervised. And that wasn't going to work if you were out in the field with no way of talking to, to your supervisor. Hence, ham radio's value really stood out. Okay, we just have an earthquake. You can decide how big it is, but at any rate, this is when you start saying, oh, Jupiter's not what I went through. So, first order, be safe. Be sure your family is safe. Remember, you're, you're activated as soon as the things fall off the shelf. By the, by the way, that's a, a, about a, a modified Mercalli scale six earthquake. However, remember, you're not really able to do much. You're not fully covered under DSW until you've checked in and been given an assignment. So again, I underline this because I think that's very important. You're not useful to the town unless they know you're available and know what you're doing. If you have a ham radio license, even to, uh, if you have a ham radio without a license, you can listen to the Los Altos Hills repeater. If you're actually a ham and a surf person, you would then check into the net. Now, you can be the first person on the net, and traditionally we say the first person is net control. But you may not be familiar with the procedures. You can be very nervous about it. You don't have to be net control. All you really have to do is to say that you're ready to report your damage report when someone becomes net control. If you're comfortable as a net control, and later on we'll talk about what that means, you can then follow instructions that will be, that are available to actually activate the net. The first order of business is to get Mike Mike reports. Now, Mike Mike is modified Mercalli. I'm going to jump to this for a minute. This started because I was uh, sitting in my easy chair one evening on the, on the weekly net when an earthquake occurred in Milpitas. And I started calling for damage reports and I was getting, oh, it's an earthquake. Oh, yeah, it was a big earthquake. Oh, yeah, we really shook. And I realized they didn't tell me anything. So we now use this Mike Mike listings of the various levels of damage for us to be able to actually keep track of how badly and what part of the city has been affected. So the definitions are, as I just showed you, we summarize these reports and they're reported to the county but also reported through our own system up to the city. Um, we find one of the hymns to do the transfer. Um, the actual check-in becomes your call sign, the Mike Mike report level, your zone, and then your you close by your call sign. And so we'll talk some more about that in a little while. Once Mike Mike reports up and well, let me pause. Any questions at this point? Ah, a silence is, is fun, but you can ask questions. Uh, I don't see Mike, Larry. Yeah, go ahead. I don't see any questions on the chat, so you're good. Okay. Um, after the Mike Mike reports have been obtained, um, the net control, the actual net control will be turned over to recon. The logic behind this is that the initial Mike Mike reports are needed by the town and the county, but once that information is available, then the task is let's find out what's happened in the town. So in this process, this by the way is my proposed my the way I think this is going to work, and it's a, I will make the comment here that. This may change, it should change as we practice the various aspects. This is not chiseled in stone, it's more floating in the, in the internet. Uh, what it comes down to is if you see something we should change, please let me know. Um, in the meantime, the person who will have a recon staff person who is identifying the responders who have said, and by the way, we will ask 
what have you had any experience in recon? And if so, would you be willing to respond as a recon surveyor? If you say yes, we'll start figuring out what your job would be. And so we first will determine which hands are ready. And then we start pairing. And well, I'm going to talk about pairing in a minute. But the bottom line is we're going to be sending people out to either in the field initially or to the ARC, depending on the assignments that we have. And we will assign first critical infrastructure routes and then uh, zone surveys. And I'll be covering that material. Then we get to what we're living in today with Corona. It's really interfering with our operations, mostly because the traditional plan for recon was three people per vehicle, a driver, a communicator, and a record keeper. Scribe, as my wife very carefully points out. Uh, the point here is that it's gonna be difficult to do in that level under, while we're dealing with Corona-19. So there are a variety of choices. I'm not sure which one's going to work out the best, but I would well, ask the question a week or so ago, uh, people and all four of these ideas were considered as viable. Uh, operating with a family member in your vehicle is certainly is the best way, but if it's two hands, you just lost a hand because you could have been having that person in another vehicle. But it certainly, uh, you could, it's not as easy to do, but single hand per vehicle is certainly doable. Uh, second rider placed in a rear seat far from the driver. I learned from Neil that this is what the Red Cross do. And then it was commented that we could drive two separate vehicles as a team. And so this is what we're going to talk about in the future. Um, I stop here to make a note that as soon as you re start responding, you should fill out this unit log because to jump into the bottom, it turns out FEMA really cares about how many volunteer hours are involved. I was told that as much as 40 or 50 percent increase in the reimbursement can come about depending on how large a uh, volunteer hour level might be for an event. Uh, keep that in mind. It, it's important. Question? Go ahead. Um, if you go, let me see, if you go back maybe one or two slides, this one, uh, the option with the uh, family member and vehicle, just to be specific, if I said I want to go out in a car and my wife, let's say, is the driver and I'm the ham operator, what is the latest word on whether she would need any kind of DSW uh, rating or qualification in order to be the driver of the car that I'm in while I do that hypothetical task? That's a very valid question, and I think the answer is they presently would want to have that person be a DSW, but I think my personal opinion would be that in a really major crisis, I'm sure they aren't going to say you have to stay home. I don't know. And so, Victoria, you're going to be my note keeper. Right? Put a flag on that one because it's a good question. Yes, I think that we're going to be having another meeting regarding literally just this issue because I think there's um, a lot of things we need to work through to come up with what, what we have as options and what, what we um, can cover and what's not covered to make sure everybody is safe, no matter if it's a family member, um, each other, or whatnot. So we're definitely going to be tabling that for another meeting for sure. I had a quick question also. Yes. Oh, wait. I don't... Go ahead. I was just wrapping up. I'll say it's a real force multiplier to be able to do that. And in the absence of guidance, if, if something happened tomorrow, I'd go do it with her and I'd, you know, ask forgiveness later or something. So, you know, let us know if there's some real good reason why that would be a bad idea if it hypothetically happened tomorrow. Yeah, we definitely have been discussing uh, some of these issues and um, we know that we need, we need to figure out something sooner rather than later. Um, again, I, I had a 
a few questions. You mentioned something about we should put make sure we put down all our hours or as much as we can or, because somebody gets reimbursed, I guess. So who gets reimbursed? When there's a major emergency, like the fires we're presently dealing with, uh, the state will go to the federal government, to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and yeah. uh, given the right documentation, we'll pay up to 80% of the costs of the emergency. And that can be big. In the fires, it can be billions of dollars. So that gets paid to whom? To the state. The state effectively bills the federal government and says, it cost me $3.2 billion to fight the fires. And you have said you would reimburse us for vehicle use or whatever the tasks are that were involved. There's a lot of details in this that have to be carefully followed in the uh, one of the hurricanes, the Katrina, it depended on whether your dumpster was in your yard or on the roadway, whether FEMA would cover the reimbursement. It's that level of uh, detail. But if they if they agree, they can realistically cover most of the cost of a fire or emergency. All right. Thanks. Sure. Um, again. I just talked about your unit, uh, the, um, let's go back and say unit log. Um, the real key here is that two parts. One is your manager wants to know what you thought you were doing. Did you, when did you go out on that uh, zone survey, for instance, and when did you get back? They're not worried too much about, hey, I needed to go to the bathroom. But the real point here is they want to be able to refer to this when someone asks, well, was Charlie out on the on the zone survey at two o'clock? And the answer is yes or not. So um, we just, uh, we've talked about what we do. We established the Los Altos Hills. Oh, I love my typo lady. She didn't catch it. I didn't catch it. We have a new definition of earthquake. Uh, <laughs> Obtain the mic mic reports from all the hands on the net, identify the experience of the hands, establish teams, and now we get into what do you do once you have your teams. The critical infrastructure surveys I'm going to be describing, and then there's going to be additional surveys using groups of zones for coverage, and I'll tell you about that. Um, Part of the task on this list was connect recon non-hams with recon hams. And this comes back to how many people uh, in the vehicle. But if we can indeed find people who want to help and they can, there's a big enough vehicle that you can realistically be far apart, uh, we would put two hand, a ham and a non-ham in the vehicle to spare the load. Uh, that would be done at the ARC. You would meet the um, non-ham cert at the ARC and start from the ARC itself. Um, the another part of this is now you're out on assignment. We've sent you out on assignment to survey a set of infrastructure, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the order of business now for your, your scribe and your vehicle is to keep track of when or if you heard from the net control or you had to tell the net control something. Part of this is, remember I said we are going to need to do supervising. Well, supervision for ham radio is net control calling you if they haven't heard from you or even if they have, doing uh, about every half hour a health and welfare check. And so it might be Team A, this is net control, health and welfare, and your response, team A, all okay. That short in information, but you did respond. If you did not respond, then we have to figure out why not. And you have to figure out, hey, I haven't heard from net control. Is my radio not working? Or am I in a bad location? I haven't heard from anyone, therefore I must be in a bad location. That communications log is helpful for both you and net control 
and keeping track of what actually they have said and you have said. All right, now we get into actual tasks. Remember I said that the there were more zones than there were uh, certs. Well, there were 58 zones. There are something like 58 uh, zones and 65 or so critical infrastructures within the town. Yeah, I thought that too. How many? But the reality is that uh, Neil and Dave Stewart have worked out uh, prioritizing into five uh, infrastructure routes and something like, well, 16 zone area groups. That's my term. It may change, but uh, let's start with the idea. This is all of the various locations of infrastructure, whether it be schools, churches, overpasses, uh, water tanks, water pumps throughout the town. Now, that's a pretty massive set of images. Uh, if you look at the different colors, those actually are different area infrastructure routes. There's a north, east, uh, east, west, and south route. And for example, here is infrastructure route five with each of these dots being a different location that needs to be visited, at least visually. And this is, a, I know it's an eye chart, so I've enlarged it. And uh, the first, of, for example, is Grand Bullis School. Uh, you may find a whole bunch of Carissima Villa Water District tank, uh, Station, Town Hall, and etc. This is all on the on on the Google Documents location for all the search, so that you can actually go there and find this information yourself. This critical infrastructure, um, whoops, sorry, I jumped one. Let me see if I can go back to it real quick. Uh, is a infrastructure survey instruction program, uh, form that you'll find on the Google Doc. Neil has put together carefully um, quantitative instruction list for how to fill these forms out. But for the moment, let me just take a second and give you an idea of what the northern, this is now north of Foothill College, what the zones look like. And so you've got zone one right next to zone 35. On the other side is, is uh, 1949. The end result was, how do you tell people where you want them to go? When they, when Neil and Dave put their idea together, I outlined what is now a zone group. Whoops, I've got to be careful which button I push on my, on my pointer. Um, the key here is that you will be now asked to survey inside this area every street there is in that area. So. You go to an individual zone, zone map, and you will see not only every street, but the property line for every house on those streets. Uh, we can discuss this uh, uh, in length probably, but my approach, if I were given this assignment, would have a highlighter pen and I would highlight every street I've read been on. That would, if it was green, I'd use green and say, everything's okay. If there's a problem, I use red or something of that sort. But the real point here is you're going to need to get this information quickly so the town knows if there's a fire, if there's major injuries, uh, the water tank is flowing down the street six feet deep. Um, it can happen. And that's the sort of thing the town needs to know. So there's a set of instructions about how to actually document what has happened at a particular location. And this, and this I will refer you to the website just as to this is let you know the sort of tasks that you will have. I'll now explore and take a moment for questions and then move further. Any questions? There was one from Mira. Um, she was wondering, <clears throat> Um, 
what additional privileges does a FCC license um, give you versus a regular ham? Uh, the FCC license is how you get to be licensed as a ham. That's correct. We, Somebody answered that already in the in the chat. Well, that's why there's no harm in asking it again. What I've learned, by the way, is that if there's anybody who has a question, it's almost always that they're not the only one. They're just the most daring. Right. So I have so, no problems. I guess, you. Larry, you mentioned in your um, slide a ham and an FCC license. So could you be a ham without a license? No, what was intended, and, and I'm thinking back to it, is that you don't have to have an FCC ham license to listen on a ham radio. Okay. And there's a lot of value in that because that means even if you're not a ham, you can be quickly informed with, number one, do you need to even respond? We had an earthquake, that earthquake I mentioned over in East Bay, uh, the county OES director listened to our net and realized they didn't have to uh, respond and set up OES. So it's really valuable just listening. And I will, and I, I really want to push that for everyone who's a cert. It's only, it's less than $40 to get a radio that will listen easily to this. And when you have your license, now you've got your ham radio. You can, once you have your FCC license, you can be on the air to report what you've learned. Thank you, Larry. Sure. Um, Non-hams into recon. This is really what we just were exploring, the idea that there are going to be people, be people who have been interested in recon, but don't have a ham license yet. If you are, if the internet, or more precisely, the cell towers are up, you could text and will establish a policy for who you text to say that you'd like to help like to respond, but I would really bet the most likely move for you if you don't have a, have a hand license is to go to the ARC. We're going to have one of the first assignments is going to be to place a hand radio operator at the ARC in Federal College. So if you don't have a license, my strong recommendation is go find the ham down at Federal. So, Mike report, Mike Mike's from everyone. Recon teams will start with infrastructure surveys and then the assignment to zone groups will be made after that. It may not be every zone group that could. What's interesting is that even in small an area as ours, there were a major range of damages that occurred. Our house was firing, our house 200 feet from ours was destroyed. A house is up, a valley view, a hilltop were fine, and there was one house up there that was destroyed. So it's it's important to find out what where the most reports are coming in and then send people to survey those. I reinforced be sure to maintain radio contact with net control. If you don't hear us, find a location where you're able to announce your status. Otherwise, we have to come find you. And that can be a real pain for any, both sides. But remember, this is a dangerous time and things could happen. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, about a month ago, two months ago, well, pre-COVID-19, to be at a picnic with my grandchildren. Walking back from the car, my daughter-in-law says, Dad, look out. I look to the right. And a four inch diameter, 25 foot long tree branch landed two feet to my left. If I had turned left, you wouldn't be hearing from me tonight. The point being that kind of thing can happen even more likely after an earthquake. So if you don't tell us you're okay, we have to come find out whether you're okay. Uh, if you're driving alone, Stop by the side of the road. Don't try to do talking and writing while you're driving. And the final point, if you witness an accident, a fire, etc., report to 911 or try to first. And then 
after that, if you can't do that, uh, or even if you can, tell net control. There are details on how you report this. There are other things we'll be training you about, but this evening's intent is to give you an overview. With that in mind, I thought it might be useful to touch on some of the protocol that will be involved in reporting any of your mic mic or damage reports for that matter. One of the key things you run into is that many hams will want to report immediately and you might have 20 or 30 hams all talking at once. So remember that control can only use information for one ham at a time. So what usually is done Net control is going to say, okay, I'm just going to ask for call signs only, and I will acknowledge your call signs. And then when I've captured all the call signs, I'll go back to and ask each of you to report. So be patient. If, if, if you've ever been net control, there are many things you can be doing other than just talking on the radio. If the incident commander has come over to you and told you, send out the following message, you, you're going to have to talk to him, not be on the radio. Um, after the net control has recognized all the call signs, they'll start asking for reports. In an earthquake environment, you most likely will hear, I now ask for any calls, any responders with a mic mic report of six or larger, six or higher call signs only, please. And that kind of procedure helps control the net. Once you get asked for your call for your report, your, your call sign, mic mic value, your zone, and your call sign. And phonetically, please, if you and you will practice this, if you realize how hard it is to hear somebody get E six A G J and figure out what that person said, uh, you realize why phonetics are important. Um, we're going to do training. This is the, the basic logic of what I would like to be doing is I like operating a net where you can do no wrong, except for not trying to say something on the net. Uh, the real point here is until you have had practice actually trying to interact on a ham net, uh, it's, it's nerve wracking. It's, it's mic fright. And so I very much want to make it so that all of you are extremely comfortable, not only in reporting things, but also remembering that you're operating in peacetime. Imagine the, uh, the extra stress that comes from being in the middle of the aftermath of an earthquake. So we'll have evening. Uh, First, I imagine we'll do Zoom discussions and, and, and operations, and then actually use radio to do the same sort of communication. And as you become more familiar, we'll expand. So get your hand license. There's easy ways to do it. Well, there are many ways. They may not be that easy, but there's an online practice. I know because that's how I got my license. Uh, you just simply learn all the answers because it's not, it's, uh, you just practice long enough and you know all the answers. Or you can do it the way my wife did it, where you go to a class and there are scheduling cram classes for him radio license where you actually can expect to pass the exam at the end of the class. Now there's a certain caveat built into the present world in that they haven't figured out exactly how to uh, proctor the exams, but that is something that will be coming. And you can work with us, with the recon members, because most of, there's a classic old time description of the old ham who is happy to help young ones. He's called an Elmer. And we have a bunch of Elmers in our group who are very happy and I want to reinforce this, that the only bad question is the one you didn't ask. So use your ham license, your ham radio before you, I made this point, before you get your license, you can listen 
the ham radio, the bell phone is less than forty dollars on Amazon. Once you have your license, we'll, you can join our weekend nets or actually practice with many of the other nets that are on at various times throughout the day. And so that's my talk. And questions are welcome. I have a question, Larry. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm a little confused about the sequence of events. Um, I, I, I'm in zone eight, and I understand that when things fall off the shelf, uh, we're supposed to go out and uh, go around zone eight and then come to the ark. Uh, should I go to the ark first and then uh, go to zone eight? And well, the answer to that is multifaceted. The starting point is that policy of having you survey your own zone and then go to the ark uh, doesn't work in the new version of the disaster service worker program because unless the town knows what you're doing and knows that you're surveying your own area uh, you're not going to be covered under the disaster service worker program and they don't want you to be doing anything. Now, the next part of that question becomes, what's a higher priority? Finding out what happened in your own neighborhood or making sure that the water tank isn't about to wash whole neighborhood away because it's come off its foundation and 100,000 gallons of water going down the street. The point being, that in terms of the town's concern, if you're a recon operator, the town wants you to be prioritizing the critical structures uh, of the town. It's going to be realistically, if the earthquake occurred and there's schools with students in them, it's more important to find out what happened to those 400 students than the four people up your street. And so the uh, other part of that is it might turn out the town, the recon management says, hey, yes, your zone is important. Please go survey it. But first you need to have the recon management tell you to do it. The okay, town so has decided that recon management are authorized to make DSW assignments, but you have to get the recon management to do so. So to follow up, if uh, uh, if we call in after things have fallen off the shelf, for the example, and you tell us to go ahead and, and do the, uh, or the ARC tells us to go ahead and survey Zone 8. We used to have two or three uh, Zone 8 uh, CERT people in it, and we had a, uh, a place that we'd all meet uh, in case of an emergency. Oh. Yes, uh, that's a fair question. The answer, I guess, really uh, stands out when we were doing this process of sending uh, teams out to survey zones, uh, we would get telephone calls from the cert in the zone saying, hey, I'm surveying my zone and we just sent out a cert team. How come? And the reality was he only called after he saw the cert person. So we had no way of knowing the zone was being covered. Well, we, uh, it, it sounds like we definitely need to contact the ARC immediately and notify them of what we're doing, whether we're coming into the ARC or we want to survey or we see something that's very uh, 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 dangerous and needs to be uh, attention. So if we just call the ARC immediately, well, the answer is there won't be anybody at the ARC. Okay. Because remember, all of us are distributed around town when the earthquake occurs. It may take the, the very first words that will be spoken about the earthquake are going to be on the radio. I remember one earthquake that occurred, and by the time I went from my bedroom to my radio in the living room, there were six people reporting what they'd experienced. So if you're looking for rapid reporting of what's happening, the ham radio operation, the mic mic reporting is going to be 
many, many minutes before the arc is operational. Okay. It's one of those challenges of trying to figure out how you use a very limited resource in the most effective way. And the challenge becomes you've got enormous number of critical structures and only a few people to go look at them. And uh, then it, be, it starts becoming a matter of deciding what's the best good for the most people in the shortest time. That sounds like the search standard, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. But that's really what, that's the challenge about this is that there's not going to be enough people or, and, and there's going to be a lot of problems. And so what we're realistically talking about is trying to identify what the most serious problems are as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, anyone else? Larry John here. Yes. Um, so I'm curious about this transition. You just alluded to it uh, in the time between uh, when all of the chatter is happening on the radio and the time between when the ARC has personnel on site. So for example, when you talk about uh, making assignments to send people out or teams out, is that the sort of thing that's, that's a conference among a handful of people who are, let's say, you know, incident leader or the first few and does that only happen when people have arrived at the ARC or can some of those assignments begin to be made even while people are only on radio? I would imagine my approach to it would be that if I were, uh, I had somebody being net controlled and I was listening as a ham, think of myself as a ham recon supervisor, I would be sitting down at that moment saying, okay, what do I wanna have these people do first? What if I'm going to do infrastructure, which ones of these people might I send out as single people? Or if I can, do I send them to the ARC to join up with others? But all that can be done while we're still getting Mike Mike reporting. And in fact, I was in, if I were running the show, I would be saying to you, as soon as you said you were available for recon, I'd have you on infrastructure route one which is all the overpasses, because if any of those are down, the whole game changes. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of priority I would just start and say, go document that information. The next time I put on the other infrastructure. So it sounds so, like the, the recon lead then who may be net control or may not be net control. I uh, think, uh, in my opinion, the net control is going to be busy just getting information. And All right. so there's already two people. There's a lead and a net control, and but they not, may not be in the same physical location. Are they somehow sidebar communicating with each other, or are I they? Don't know that they have, my answer would, be, and I've been chewing on the same question. I would picture that the net control would be in one home, and the actual uh, recon manager would, or for that matter, incident commander would be in another home. But the answer you see is. I would be listening to the same, I would be recording all of the hands who have, or in fact, let's say it a little differently. I, net control would first get my mic, mic reports and then net control would turn around and say, oh, I'm going to now ask you for your, your, what have you had experience doing? Have mm -hmm. you had experience as a recon operator? Have you had experience operating at the EOC? What about experience at the ARC? or you just assert without, but haven't had much experience. The point being, I can now identify who I have that can do individual searches or who I might say, go to the ARC. So I could then tell net control, I could say net control, I'd like to have a, a, a directed call. And I would then get on the air and say, your call sign, go to XYZ, call sign number two, go to X, X, some other location. Then you go back and you and once I've given you the assignment, you do your your conversation with net control. So it's sort of like I'm incident commander, and I give an assignment to you. Yeah. Then you talk to net control, saying I'm leaving home. I'm at X location or Y location. Looks like David so, pulling up written answers to the questions here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Go over the process really quick. Yeah. Okay. 
So we do have a written document on how this is all supposed to work. I didn't want to interrupt Larry because the only thing he was saying wrong was the way I would do it is, but he's basically got it correct. Um, you know, what he's describing is that the net control operator effectively becomes the IC for the first little bit and drives the process until we get the arc set up. But the idea is that the people who are on the net are figuring out who's going to be the real IC, who's going to go to the ARC, who's going to set this all up. And, um, you know, I think at the top of this document, it says draft and, you know, not officially uh, approved, but given that this is what we have, this is what we have. Yeah, I, I didn't put draft in the front of mine, but I, I really hope that people understood that it is not yeah. chiseled in stone. By yeah, and, and I didn't hear Larry say anything that was wrong, except, you know, the way I would do it. Uh, the way we're supposed to do it is basically what Larry said. Yeah, that's okay, what it was all about. The, the transition of control, it's like you're building the airplane while you're trying to take off on the runway. So that's right. This that's makes right. sense. Thank but you know we would be on the net together so we could figure out you know okay so who's going to run the net and who's going to take charge of uh you know doing the planning and getting this thing lit uh and who's going to run down to the arc and try and get it open and it will depend on how many people are on the net and how many people we can get hold of at any given time and the and the other part that in my mind is that those people who need to be down at the arc are going to be focused on getting to the arc and getting it running. Yeah. So there's going to be an incident commander ultimately doing all of the tasks, but there's going to be probably an interim uh, sub commander, if you will, deputy who is handling the assignments for the uh, recon people who have first arrived. Remember that this is going to be a time, times are going to pro progress. I mean, you're going to get an initial set of responses, but it depends a lot on what, how carefully they have and how big a family they have, how much they've had to worry about their aunt and uncle or next door neighbor before they can actually get on the air to respond. They may get on to give a mic mic report to tell you they're not available to actually do anything for another hour. Larry and David, I got a question. Uh, right now, I try to understand how the decision of activated get proceeded. For example, if, if initially there was an earthquake, there's an earthquake, and uh, three or four ham on the radio and reporting five or six, uh, uh, five or six mic mic scale. On, in their home, but then do we just wait? I mean, at what point uh, somebody who could decide that it should be activated? That's what I got confused. Uh, uh, Dave has highlighted uh, part of that, and, the, and it really depends on how serious the earthquake is. If there's all six, Mike, Mike, six or above, then you clearly know things, are, it's time to do something. Uh, the, it's going to be an interesting question if there's sections of town that are sevens and other sections of town that are fives. But that's, you know, if any section is seven, I would activate. I would, I would rather be safe than sorry is what it comes down to. So, the, so are you saying the authority of, of the declaring the activation rests on the, just a particular ham? have been in charge on the net and and after listen listen to the mic mic report and made a judgment is that it yes this is that's something basically it. Dave, go ahead no i was going to say that's it i mean uh, it says here in the document that if uh we look at the mic mic reports and we have over 25 percent are six or any sevens or eights then we're activated we begin the rest of the activation process now we do need, I think, and I know it was spoken about, but I haven't seen it yet, some idea about who, what we would expect of a cert recon person to, what's, what sort of experience they should have before they start telling people, you go to one location, somebody else go elsewhere. Um, 
the assumption here is that, in my mind, is there might not be a large team of people like that. So if you're lucky in the early stages of an event, um, there will be one or two who, uh, and Dave, I'm going to have to have you, Neil, and whoever uh, work on that if it's not already documented. I don't remember seeing anything saying what the actual uh, qualifications will be. Yeah, I don't know that there are qualifications, although while you've been talking, I've been looking to see if I have um, the critical infrastructure list and the routes on my you know, thumb drive that I keep in my pocket all the time. And I'm discovering that if uh, it were to happen right now, I would have difficulty figuring out what the critical infrastructure was to go look at. So that's sort of the first thing is we need to be more careful about making sure that information is widely available. That and uh, as I started thinking about what we're talking about, uh, after the earthquake, it's very likely you're not going to be able to print anything because the electrical power is gone. Uh, it seems to me we're going to want to have this information in notebooks. If you're doing an infrastructure or zone uh, group, that maybe we want to go back to actual notebooks with that information at the ARC. I keep lobbying that everybody should have their little zipper notebook. And this was this turns out to be a big zipper notebook. Well, I remember mine, the time mine's gotten bigger over the years. It, the, I remember when Carol and I were working on actually having all the zones in one. It was a four-inch thick notebook. It's not something you stuck in your pocket. But what you're hearing us talk about to the rest of you is that this is a dynamic challenge that is going to, to a significant extent, require some tabletop exercises and some actual field exercises to quantify the implications of what we're trying to do. Uh, the devil's in the details. And there's going to be a difficult time when you're trying to deal with not just the devil, but an earthquake at the same time. So um, other comments are welcome. Turns out I actually printed this and have it in my notebook. All right, there's, a, there's an example to follow. <laughs> Larry, I think, Larry, I think Ben had a question um, regarding paperwork. Ben, do you want to ask that question? Yes, okay. I think uh, I would say, first of all, I think uh, it would be difficult for a single person to look at the map, to survey, to take a survey report, then fill out 214, 309. By the time you fill out a form, you forgot where, to, where the next stop. So I think, it, it, yeah, we're, before we, we did not have a requirement for two, uh, 309 and 214, but apparently now we are required to do so. So well, I remember that what we're talking about with those forms, uh, particularly the uh, unit log, yeah. is not going to be, uh, you stopped at, corner, at the corner of, of something streets. It's that you started the survey at 1400 hours, you reported back to the ARC at 1650. Uh, so that's, that form may only have two or three entries. The actual communications log is somewhat the same sort of thing. Uh, if you have no events, you don't have anything that you reported, and you would only be recording in the uh, if you wanted to that you were you heard from net control every half hour. So I wouldn't let those forms. Those aren't the forms that are going to hold you back. It's the incident reports that are probably going to take a more focused amount of time. But yeah. Larry, you, when you mention incident report, that's a precise the question I really want to ask. Do we still using the uh, your customizer incident report, or do we go back to uh, uh, schemas? I'm, I'm, I'll let Dave offer a comment, but my understanding would be that we continue to use our Los Altos Hills version of an incident report. Uh, it offers us the most carefully 
tailored set of questions, both in terms of what we would tell 911 and the kind of information needed by the incident commander. Uh, so I would stay with our standard form. It, I, I go back to your comment, or at least your concern. Yes, I agree if we are only one of us on the route. But I think one of the questions that will end up forcing some of this is the coronavirus. Because it has, in my mind, changed my, if I'm out on a survey, uh, in the old days, if you saw somebody hurt, you're supposed to do something. I can't afford to. Uh, the best I can do under those circumstances is to report that there's an injured person at a specific location. Uh, I can't afford to try to do uh, with the absence of uh, the proper protective equipment. Uh, I wouldn't, I couldn't afford to get near the person. Totally understand that, Larry. Um, I'm actually going to talk to Marsha after this call um, about some of the things we discussed in the options so that when we kind of get together to you talk about this again, that I have some information um, regarding um, our four options that we've been talking about and sort of the um, what the town is looking at, what they're okay with us doing, um, what they're going to cover. Um, you know, if there is somebody that's driving, right, another cert around, are they covered? How's that going to work? Do we make them an emergency, you know, worker? How does that look? So um, I should have some updates for you guys on that um, by tomorrow. Victoria, one of the things that we talked about uh, way back in the day, and we may want to revisit with the town, is the ability for the supervisors or for some of the uh, uh, certs to be able to swear in DSWs uh, during the emergency, and that would get us covered in this uh, situation, right? You have a volunteer, like a, a wife or a son or somebody, uh, you swear them in at the point of the emergency, and then they are DSWs and can help. And I mean, that used to be one of the things we talked about doing to solve this problem. I don't know if the town would still be comfortable with that. Okay, I will definitely um, bring that to her attention and see what, what the thought process is um, for that. I'm taking notes. Sorry, I'm trying to. I'm trying to take notes left-handed on my phone. It's not going very well. So hopefully, I can read what I wrote. Okay, yeah, got it. Yes, John. So, since you're about to talk to Marsha, I'll ask this question. A little while ago, I got told if I wanted to go out with my wife and she wasn't a DSW yet, she wouldn't be insured in the event of an accident. How about does the since for so many years we've heard CERT say don't go out without a buddy? Uh, is that just good? Uh, advice or is there something about the insurance coverage that would also be in jeopardy if a cert was out without a buddy? Uh, I can offer a comment on that because my county work on that question really focused on this idea. Uh, as I understand the cert program, its original intent was that you didn't go out alone to help people who might be injured or you're stuck just through checking on structures or things of that sort, because if you uh, were to have been trapped or something of that sort, you needed somebody else to be able to worry about you. Uh, our operations in windshield surveying with uh, ham radio capability at the county level at least operated with the idea that you were monitored and health and welfare check on a 15 minute period. And the check would always identify where you were at the time you were checked. So that if something happened, we had a, a time window and a location window that would be give us a relatively, and we knew what vehicle you were driving, would give us a quick and reasonable <clears throat> chance to find out what happened to you. But it was different if you were at CERT in the older days where all you did was the earthquake occurred and you went out to your neighbor's house. There was a different level of 
uh, gee, you better not be alone. Uh, since we are, and I would argue as part of that, you don't leave your car during uh, your surveys. It's a windshield survey. You're not going off and saying, gee, I'm going to run into this place or that place. Your task is to cover a large area safely. Sounds reasonable exception. Uh, so you're being looked at over, over the radio effectively. Yes, and that's really the point. And what's so valuable about a ham radio is that you are indeed, uh, we know where you are, at least we knew where you were uh, less than 15 minutes ago. And if we have to find you, we've created a relatively small zone to look for your car and then for you. Don't, don't test it, please. But, <laughs> but still, I think it's important because it means something for us as recon people that we are a resource that's tightly supervised. And that's part of what makes us so efficient is that if something were to, I, my classic example is you're driving down a road and I just learned that there's the water tank is about to wash out the bridge right in front of you, I can quickly reach you and say, stop now, the, the bridge is about to disappear. And that kind of capability is, you don't have that without radio contact. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Larry, that may, may be a nitpicking, but but sometimes the infrastructure cannot be seen on in the car. So is, what do you do then? Just ignore that? That's a question I'll kick upstairs. Uh, my response would be in the kind of environment we're talking about, I would decide what the infrastructure task is. If it's a water tank, I don't have to see the tank. I have to see whether there's soaking water is flowing down from the tank. And there may be some effort to actually um, establish that kind of thing. The other way is if you is to go back to two or two people in the vehicle or two vehicles. But that's a judgment call I don't I'm not ready to deal with tonight. So also I can get some answers to these questions um, from Marcia and kind of have more of an idea before I say something wrong or lead somebody down the wrong path. So, um, John, I will definitely ask um, the other part of that question. Um, I do, my understanding was the same thing that Larry said, more of a safety factor, but there might be some more things to that that we haven't really, you know, that have changed or haven't been told or not aware of. So, I'll definitely follow up on that. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? I see Mira, do you want to ask your question? Hi, uh, yeah. I was just wondering in the past we had sent out signs to all the uh, residents to indicate, you know, if they needed help or not. Because especially now we cannot really go into the houses and check or go too close. So if the residents help out by putting signs, you know, in front of their mailboxes, up their driveways, the task of the recon which has already become difficult in this time, can be made slightly easier. Is that something on the plan? Do the residents know they have to do that? Is that something we remind them? What, what is on the agenda for that? Yes, we actually just um, did a new one um, with the OK and then the help sign. And I know that's been an active push. Um, I can find out where we're at with that um, and send out an update. Um, I'm pretty sure they were pushing that has anyone gotten a new one or seen the new ones? No. Okay. I know they've been being they've been being worked on. So um, well, let me yeah. get an update to that. But yes, that is something. Dave, do you know anything more about that? I'm I, just curious. Well, so like last I heard, we were on version 23 or something. Yeah. And I think we're getting <laughs> close. Um, okay. But there was <laughs> some other issue just before they were going to mail them out. But I I do think we're getting pretty close. Yeah, let me see if I can get an update. That's what I heard last too, was that we were in version literally 23. So um, let me find out that out for you guys. Interesting question comes with that. And that is, 
if I see a sign as I'm doing windshield survey that says I need help, I can't, I don't see myself stopping to go see what that help will be. I, I can see reporting that that sign had a, had a help on it. So I, we have to be careful about what we're offering the people that put out the signs. Uh, I'm, this is where I'm going to turn the question over to Dave or Neil about what the latest level of detail is going to be expected when we do windshield surveys. Uh, tonight's discussion was mostly in my mind about how we would, how I would see our operations and the communication side. And I think there's a fair number of questions remaining about what information ends up being reported. Yeah, the, uh, the idea now is pretty much that um, we're going to do the critical infrastructure survey first, then if we have time and inclination, we would do the uh, uh, windshield survey, the hasty survey across the entire town. And then after that, we would probably go back and do a knock on doors. The latest version, excuse me, I've seen of the help OK sign does not have a help sign for exactly that reason. We were concerned that it set the wrong expectation that we, you know, if you put that sign out, someone would actually show up and we can make no guarantees that that will happen. On the other hand, uh, if it's just an okay sign and the backside gives some emergency preparation information, then people who put out the okay sign, we know that we don't need to stop there and, and talk to them when we do finally get around to doing those surveys. That makes more sense to me because it, it has, and Hey, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Good. Yeah, I was thinking uh, that was a great idea until I started thinking about evacuating. And it would be interesting to see uh, for people who had difficulty, uh, mobility problems or other issues with evacuating, whether we could do more of a neighbor to neighbor thing if the help signs went out. But uh, just an opinion from the last couple of days, I'm pretty sure we're just going to do the okay for exactly those reasons. Yeah, it's a, the really scary part of this whole process is how everything has gone bad at once and how little time you have to deal with many, many, many issues at once. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the locusts. <laughs> yeah. yes. Don't even put that out in the world, Dave. <laughs> the, the locusts are, have already been flying. They just haven't been flying. Yeah, here. <laughs> just not here. <laughs> what was it, seven billion fly you know, per acre or some silly number? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Um, I think Elise had a comment. Elise, oh. did you have a comment? Hang on. So I was going to say that um, not that my health is the greatest, but I somehow seem to be so far somewhat resistant to the COVID. I work in a market and I do what I'm supposed to do. I wear my gloves. I wear my mask, which mostly, you know, protects other people from me, I guess. And uh, people around me know I have an allergy because, you know, and my nose runs or whatever. I just I tell people so they know. Um, but I'm thinking from all those years that I worked with the kids, the Jeremy kids, the Jeremy special ed kids as a teacher, maybe I'm somewhat resistant. I don't know. So if anybody among us all is going to interact with somebody, I guess it's going to be me because I'm probably at less risk. I don't know for sure. I could be wrong, but that's what I think, even though I do have some health issues because, you know, like I'm 62 now. So, you know, Unless you had an one of my family test. is starting to show up in me. Unless you've had a positive antibody test. You just probably haven't been exposed to it. I just don't know. I don't know. But I'm, yeah. I'm getting, you know, even though people tell me I'm wrong, I yeah, like I said, I've, I've uh, like, you know, teachers tend to be kind of resistant to stuff because we've Yeah, except nobody has had this before. This is a brand new disease. Well, I'm thinking of it more as um, my uh, immune system is a little bit better than average for your average female 62 year old because I know when I was a teacher and also more recently, there have been some times when I feel like I'm coming down with something and then it goes away after a few hours. One time it seemed to, just a tiny, tiny bit more persistent and, it, and I had it another hour or two, whatever was coming on, but I just drank a lot of orange juice, had some soup and it went away. So I, I had some of the symptoms uh, 
about two weeks ago and it went away after a couple of days and I happened to get an antibody test and it showed that I had not been exposed to the disease. So. Uh, I think I, 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 I don't know a lot of us, science about this. The, the I, bottom I can, line for us is that we're going to have to operate on the absolute assumption that we're in an environment <laughs> where it could be a problem. And the answer really, that's one of the reasons why I would be willing to be uh, a, a solo driver with all the additional challenge that goes with it because of the fact that I'm, well, I'm 82 and I'm not exactly one who's going to venture into the, into the outside world casually, let's say it like that. Well, I think, I think really the, the topic is not who's going to be the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> it's going yeah. to be that when we do come into these, these um, situations, as you said, Larry, you know, the assumption should always be, and that's basic first aid, someone has something that you can get from them, right? So how do we counteract that? We social distance, we wear our PPE, we wear our gloves, we wear our mask, we wear our goggles, we cover up all those areas of exposure. Um, you know, um, Elise, I have been around this since day one, um, and I haven't had um, uh, an antibody test, but I've also had symptoms and have been negative. Um, I think that um, I can appreciate your immune system because I did work with children too for many years. Um, so I, I get what you're saying. Um, however, um, this is something new, as you said, Steve, I'm in full agreement. This is a new thing that no one has built up immunity for. Um, does that mean that um, your immune system won't help you if you get exposed? Who knows? Your immune you system might, could be great. Uh, right. Know. You don't, nobody you, has the yeah. energy to it. Right. Nobody's built that up yet. So, um, you know, I think um, I really am happy to hear that you're taking the precautions and doing your social distancing, wearing your mask, wearing your gloves, you know, doing what you can, because that obviously has cut down on a lot of your exposure. Um, so I think, you know, as long as you continue doing that and, and taking those precautions in, in all aspects, I think that you're, you know, going to really limit your exposure because, you know, the word exposure means you've been exposed to it. That means you've had some, you know, some, you're not wearing your PPE or you've been too close to somebody, right? That's a true exposure, really. If you're protecting yourself and you're doing a social distancing and stuff like that, your exposure is really, really, really um, uh, how you're going to, to alleviate a lot of your risk, right? What was that, Steve? Ah. Uh, Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna out. talk to yeah I saw that I'm gonna talk to Marsha about all of the things that we've talked about kind of all of the you know we all are in different situations there's feelings and there's you know things that we're not gonna be able to do or, or can do so we're gonna we're gonna really have to tackle this I think um, you know this presentation is has again brought this topic up of how are we gonna re, you know how are we gonna do recon what's that going to look like there's people who are who are willing to do certain uh, aspects of that and there's some people who who don't. And so I can see all of the points and all of the aspects and all the options can work for some of us and not for others. So do we leave all those options on the table and say, hey, you know, you're reporting in, okay, what's your comfort level? What are you okay with doing? Larry says, I can do it by myself. You know, uh, Victoria says, I'm gonna have another person behind me. I'll pick up another cert. They'll be behind me in the car. We're social distancing, wearing our PPE, you know, or I'm saying, hey, I'm gonna have my, um, you know, my, my child, well, my child, but my teenage driver drive me right around while I sit, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios. So I think we just really need to see who's covered and what situation in terms of other people that are not certs. Can we make them a disaster worker? Um, like Dave brought up, can we do that? Can we have a system where we do that? Um, you know, and just make sure that, that we can set those parameters. People know what, um, you know, if you do choose to do this, right. Um, then you're either covered here or not covered here, right? If you choose to have a family member, they're not covered. So maybe for most of us, we're going to be like, forget it, then that's not going to work for me, right? So I think we just need to look at the coverage and sort of what the town's expectations are. Um, this is definitely a new uncharted territory, right, um, with COVID. So I think that um, there's probably different ways we can address this. I just want to make sure that we know what the expectation is from the town, and then we can, in our group, figure out how we're going to move forward. I saw you said something, John. I, when I get late into the night, my multitasking skills really suck. So um, 
Do you want to just talk about what you were chatting about, John? Just replying to Steve, I just said that one use of two car teams could be to, be to go directly to critical infrastructure that was known to not be visible from the road. Some of the you know, survey we did a couple of years ago highlighted some of those things. I don't recall if they were all in the category of water tanks where you'd see the river running down anyway, but that's at least one possible use for that kind of team. It, it's a pretty limited case. Yeah, and I think we really could look at, you know, some of those those topics too. You know, there's like Larry was pointing out, there's some there's some critical infrastructure versus, you know, looking at houses and things like that. You know, could we set something up where we do address that? And and how does that look and, and how can we still have those those um, those assignments and do them in a in a safe environment for everybody. So yeah, I, I agree. There's definitely I think we need to table this for, let me talk to Marsha. Maybe we can have another quick Zoom if anyone's interested in talking about that and talking it through. I think that's something that um, we all probably want to um, talk about. And, and, you know, I think this evacuation thing was a little too close to home. <laughs> so, you know, I think we need to really get some things put in place um, as in order for us to feel comfort comfortable with that, for sure. Uh, Mira was asking when the next recon training is. Um, I think um, I'm going to sit with um, Larry and figure out, um, you know, how to move forward. He's got a ton of good ideas. And by the way, that was fabulous. I really enjoyed every second of your presentation, Larry. I think it was very well done. Um, it educated me in a lot of things I was not aware of. And I think definitely from, from uh, getting this structure that we've laid out, this platform, I think that it's really good for us to push forward and, and use this into a training. So Mira, we're, Larry and I were talking about in a couple of weeks, Larry, kind of starting to get, we have like three kind of ideas, three sessions to the series. This was just sort of a, a introduction presentation to, um, you know, get, get familiar with the topic. And then we're going to do a, sort of a ta like a tabletop training where actually we take the forums and maybe practice doing some of those forums and then hopefully ending up in a, in a tabletop drill or Zoom drill per se. Um, I'm not sure what that looks like right now, but I think we've got some time to sort of look into that and, and play with it a little bit. And uh, you know, obviously from what's been going on, I think um, the sooner the better. Yeah. Anything Thank else? You. Any part? Yes, no problem. Hi, Eduardo. You snuck in. I didn't. I didn't see you there earlier. Uh, still muted. Oh, I'm already out. You're fine now. Oh, okay, I found I found the uh, the no, I, I was already, but I have my thing over here, and I didn't realize it. <laughs> I think Larry was, was right on it. <laughs> Larry did right. great. This presentation yeah. was great. So thank you guys for showing up. Um, I'll let you all yeah. go so I can talk to Marsha while I still have a voice. Um, Elise, uh, set, shoot me an email with your availability in the next week or so and I'll get you that backpack. Um, and um, I will be sending out this recording. Um, I have to learn how to upload it to YouTube because that's what we're gonna start doing. We have a YouTube channel now. So I know it sounds very exciting, but I'm a little scared. Um, so um, good job, Larry. Thank you so much for everything. You guys have a great night and we'll be pushing out more information for our next week. Victoria, one more thing before everybody goes. If you don't yeah, have your great. vest yet, send me an email. Yeah. Thank you. D A V S the number two R T at Gmail. Perfect. And thank you for, the money. for doing that. <laughs> sure. All right, guys. Everybody have a good evening. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.